Yo, so considering the fact that we're already in the realm of the Camelot singularity, I figured that we go back into one of the unaddressed points in the chapter, that being the False Crusaders. By the way, if you haven't already, make sure you guys sign up for the Patreon. You get access to early content and priority on your request. If you guys haven't seen it already, Nasu and Takeuchi, the original writer and artist for Fate, they have this blog called The Bamboo Broom, and they pretty much use it as an online journal discussing different things that they have going on and their thoughts between projects. One of the things that's in this journal is Camelot Zero, which is a prequel to the events in the Camelot Singularity. It pretty much gives us some notes that sets up the foundation on why things were the way they were when we got there. And this covers a lot of different things, but as far as the Crusaders go, it tells us midway through the Ninth Crusade say someone who had should have died is given the holy grail using the power of the holy grail the expeditionary force approaches the holy land dedicating everything to the king of magic that being goetia at the time they set fire to the land and slaughter the people however in their greed they summoned the pharaoh that pharaoh of course is ozzy naturally the pharaoh confiscates the grail creates the egyptian territory and sets about building his own kingdom there so immediately, this lets us know that they are the reason that Ozzy was there in the chapter in the first place, which later gets discussed in the chapter itself. But what caught my attention here is the person that was given the grail always remained unnamed. And I wanted to try to draw some lines to figure out who that was. Now, the person that led the Ninth Crusade was King Edward I. But when I initially looked into it, my thing was, okay, there's no way that it was him because it would be too obvious. It must have been somebody else that the audience probably doesn't know about unless you do proper research. So I looked at the year that the Ninth Crusade took place, 1271 through 72, right? In between that time, even though they were up against the Mamluks, there was no notable deaths in that time period on either side. Yes, they had some bouts. There were thousands of people that went down, but there was hardly anybody to name specifically. Then I thought about the statement, someone who should have died. I'm thinking, okay, this person did die, but with no notable people going down, that couldn't possibly be the case. And then if you look at this certain situation with Edward, it makes a lot of sense. When Edward was up against the Mamluks, realistically, he didn't have enough people or the firepower to withstand having a battle with them. Not only that, but he was in their territory, they had allies to boot, and he also was waiting on his allies to come. So he was in a really bad position to begin with. And he later ended up forming a treaty because of it. The following month after the treaty, an attempt to assassinate Edward was made of uncertain origin. According to different versions, the assassin was sent by Emmer of Ramla or the Mamluk leader. Some legends also say the assassin was sent by the Hashashin leader, the old man of the mountains, aka King Hassan. But it turns out Edward killed the assassin, but received a festering wound from a poison dagger, further delaying his departure. So now I'm looking at it like the person that was supposed to die, the one that received the grail, must have been Edward. Then it also tells us that he summons the Pharaoh. But considering the context of dedicating everything to the king of magic, to Goetia, Goetia knew that giving him the grail would cause a greater disruption than anybody else. Then we have the next part of the notes. The expeditionary force loses ground. The one chosen by the Holy Grail is cornered by the people of the Holy Land. But then a mysterious servant appears and summons the false crusaders. Though this servant identifies himself as Richard the First, that being Richard the Lionheart, their appearance and behavior are far too different from his. The false crusaders capture the expeditionary force and occupy the holy land. And this is where it gets super interesting because if you guys have been keeping up with Fate Strange Fate, you already know that Richard is a focal point of the story. We already have him as a servant. But what the notes is telling us is that not only was this person not actually Richard, but some type of a doppelganger, but he was strong enough to summon a whole group of people that took down the force of Edward. And we know that he was at 
least servant level. So who exactly was this guy claiming that he was Richard the Lionheart? Considering the fact that he knew Richard's name at all, he had to have at least been either from his time or slightly after. The singularity of Camelot is jumbled up all together in general. It could be a lot of people. And then I want to go into this last bit. The Lion King and her knights marched into the Holy Land that was now controlled by the False Crusaders. Because remember, they took out Edward's force at this point. Though the False Crusaders were no match for her knights, the servant calling himself Richard I, the fake, was demonically strong. That says a lot. Even the Knights of the Round can't possibly defeat this devil without a loss. A sacrifice of two. No, three of our own will be necessary. So before the Knights of the Round finally take down the False Crusaders, they mention how the cost was heavy. This is Gawain narrating this part, by the way. He's the one that said the fake Richard is demonically strong. That's hilarious coming from him when back then, he was the one that appeared nigh unbeatable in the sun. Literally had to bust out a grand to make any true progress. Then it goes into how Gareth, Gawain's sibling, actually sacrificed herself because she couldn't stand the fact of taking out all these people any longer because she had been biting by the rules of the Lion King. She pretty much put herself in a martyr situation where she went out and got fatally wounded and Gawain was the one that ended up putting her down. Again, there's more to this Camelot Zero journal, but I just wanted to focus on the Crusades. I haven't really seen anybody talk about it. There's also some segments that go into how the Crusades and the Nasuverse were infiltrated. If you haven't seen that, the First Crusade, the Second Crusade, and the Third Crusade all had dead apostles that interfered with them, and they just started attacking everybody. They didn't care whose side you were on. In the First Crusade, we know that Nero Chaos shows up, the one with the FGO counterpart known as Fabro. If you guys remember, I brought him up before. He was in the original Tsukihime as one of the dead apostle ancestors before he got replaced by Vlog. This guy is ridiculously powerful and it said that he stained the entire desert with blood when he got there. Now why exactly is Nero there when we already know that he exists as Fabro in the FGO timelines? Could be a lot of different reasons. For one, we know that Nero becomes at least a millennium in age so this could have just been around the time that he started his journey in that transition into a dead apostle. There's also the fact that this this chapter in Strange Fate has two different writers. Nasu wrote the chapter and then Narita wrote Strange Fate. So there could be a disconnect in lore there. They could have just straight up forgot. And then there's the fact that this part of the Strange Fake manga predates Fabro's existence by several years. Could just be from a parallel timeline because we do know that those exist, but they're definitely going to have to clarify on that. Then in the second crusade, it wasn't just one, but it was multiple dead apostles that went on a rampage for three days straight. This is actually implied to be Merim Solomon, one of the dead apostle ancestors. He also works for the burial agency of the church. And if you remember me bringing up spiritual limbs, he's a great example of that. These dead apostles that showed up are just his spiritual limbs. They function as his conceptual arms and legs. There's also the possibility that they're being duplicated by his own or somebody else's intervention. You know, when the church pops out, they usually pop out in formation anyway. Really want to know what he was doing there since technically that would mean that he was going against his own people. And then in the third crusade, and by the way, this is the one that the real Richard the Lionheart was a part of. This also gets addressed in Fate Strange Fate. There was a new dead apostle that showed up. Didn't exactly confirm whether it was an ancestor or not, but it said that the dead apostle was slain by Richard Saladin and whoever the Hassan was of that time. So however strong this dead apostle was, they were still weak enough to get defeated by the combined forces of these three sides. And they were still alive, by the way. So clearly there's a whole different story to tell outside of the one that we come into when we get there. Even though Ozzy was the one that had the grail at the time because he stole it from them, Goetia's intentions was for somebody who was a part of the expedition to actually be the person that turned into the demon god. It just so happened that by the time we get there, Ozzy is the candidate and that's when we end up, you know, fighting Amon Ra inside of his temple, which realistically should have worked against us, but at at the same time, Ozzy had been severely weakened because if you guys remember, 
King Hassan just came in and pimp slapped him and sliced his head off. Crazy disrespectful. You also have to consider the fact that he was also afraid of Rongo Minion, as he should be, but that's just how it turned out. So it's crazy to see as strong as Ozzy is and as we know him to be, he still was being outdone by these two people and neither one of them had a grill. That just shows how ferocious they are. And he had one, he had it the entire time. And we know that empowers you further than it did before, on top of him being one of the top servants to begin with. And that still wasn't enough. So what I wanna ask y'all is, if they were to bring this story back around, what would be the proper way to reintroduce these dead apostles and maybe even this quote unquote fake Richard that we never really got to see? Because you guys know we do this all the time. They set us up with this great lore, this person and this person is supposed to be there, and then nothing happens. It's the craziest blue ball that I've ever seen. Nobody's blue balling harder than Tight Moon, I promise you. It's just a part of the game now. 